This week, food, glorious food, fake kippers and burgers. Yes, we're in the mood for pink herbs and green motors. This is salad, grown the old-fashioned way. You know, in shipping containers, under LED lights, without soil, in an optimised water and nutrient mix. As Farmer Spot called it, good old hydroponics. In all seriousness, it's been suggested that the type of intense farming going on here at local roots in Los Angeles could help solve the world's food problems in years to come. Transport costs can be reduced by growing plants wherever they're needed, even in areas of famine where the land and climate are too harsh. You get higher volumes and many more crop cycles during the year too. Lettuce can be grown in 30 days instead of up to 90 outdoors, and then a new crop can be grown immediately. All in all, one of these containers yields the same as five acres of land over the course of a year. It's very similar to the strawberry farm that we saw in Paris in the spring and in Miyagi in Japan in 2015, where the land had been ruined by the tsunami. But this project has much bigger ambitions. And this one is also using artificial intelligence to make some quite unusual tweaks. But before we talk about the vegetables of the future, we're off to San Francisco, where Cat Hawkins has been looking at the meat of the future. I've come to this lab in the heart of Silicon Valley to visit Impossible Foods. They claim to have invented the food of the future, a completely meatless meat made entirely of plants. It's big, it's light. That, that gives, it, it's actually remarkably important to get that both from a state of mind perspective, but actually it's also useful for interpreting the colour of meat. This is where the research happens. The aim is to reverse engineer the flavour and texture of meat using only plant extracts. And as someone who very much enjoys their meat tasting like meat, I wanted to find out how they're doing it. Well, what is it about the flavour of meat that makes it so darn delicious? Why is it so craveable? What is it that triggers your mind to say, mmm, bacon or burger? And so there's a lot that goes into that. And it turns out that flavour is about 75, 80% aroma and about 20, 25% taste. Impossible Foods found that the key ingredient that gives meat its characteristic irony taste is heme, a molecule found in most living things and especially in animal muscle. Luckily, it's also found in plants. So this is your magic ingredient, right? This is your plant-based blood. Right, and it, and it provides the flavor, the explosion of flavor you get that turns, the it's the difference between white meat chicken with a, 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 a beef burger. The company has recently flipped the switch on its meatless meat packing factory as it ramps up production. This will eventually make four million burgers a month. And the next aim is to move into chicken, pork and lamb. But it's one thing being a scientist who is enthralled by food tech and another to be a chef using the ingredients produced on your carefully crafted menu. I think we worried way too much meat in general. Uh, so it's a good way to be as close as possible to what meat looks and tastes. The Impossible Burger is now the only one Rocco has on his menu and he sells 250 of them a week. It seems like at this stage it might be a novelty for Silicon Valley diners with money to spend but of course, as always, the true test is in the tasting. OK, it's about to happen. It's really good. The texture is just like meat. It doesn't taste like minced beef. It looks like mushrooms. I know there's no mushrooms in there. So I've just tasted it and it's delicious. 
but it, it doesn't taste quite like meat to me. Is that something that you notice? Yeah, it's a little leaner as a meat. I would say like a bison meat, uh, but it looks like it. Uh, it's got that kind of umami flavor of the, the irony part of the blood. Uh, it's close enough. It tasted good as I was eating it, but afterwards it left a slightly strange taste in my mouth. Very strong, very irony. Still, it is healthier than meat and has zero cholesterol, so maybe it's worth it. What comes across talking to Rocco, though, is how important it is for his customers that the flavour is close to meat while still being ethical. But what if you could serve up actual animal flesh without a single creature being harmed? That's what several companies, including this small tech startup in the heart of Silicon Valley, are working on. They plan to grow actual fish from stem cells. It might sound like an unnerving prospect, but they believe this truly is the future. Fish consumption is rising, fish demand is rising, but the production can't go any higher. 52% of all fisheries are exploited, fully exploited. 25% above that are in collapse, they're overexploited. So we only have 23% of the world's fisheries left that we can use to increase production. So if we still want to eat fish at the rate that we're eating it, we have to do this. Finless Foods takes a small sample of cells from a real fish and cultures it up. One cell can theoretically become one ton of fish meat, but they're not there yet. We'll be on the market in three years with products that um, are a new version of fish that people haven't had before. And then in five to six years, we'll have steaks and fillets, just like the fish that you currently eat at the supermarket, just like what's inside of a fish that you'd normally see in the ocean. And they're not the only company working on what some dub clean meat. Just this week, Hampton Creek claimed they will hit the stores with their lab-grown meat by 2018. And around the corner at Memphis Meats, they've already produced fried chicken and meatballs from stem cells. But at $18,000 for a pound of beef, there's a long way to go. Scaling up will mean finding a new medium to help grow the stem cells. Currently, the blood of calf fetuses is used, which is expensive and, of course, if you don't want to hurt animals, pretty self-defeating. But the biggest hurdle for Mike is getting rid of the horrified reactions from people when they even hear the idea of lab-grown meat. You know, when I walk into a room at any sort of conference, I can see in people's eyes, like, oh, this is, this is the next big evil corporation that's going to put things in my food that I don't understand. And I think that that's justified in a way. I mean, people have been fooled and people have been given things they don't understand into their food supply without them being asked. And so people are right to be wary of us. And so one of my main missions is really to talk to people and to really make them understand that like, we are people, we are environmentalists, we're conservationists, and we're on the same team. We're all trying to do this together. With a population due to increase to 9.7 billion by 2050, many people feel current approaches to food production are unsustainable. Cultured meat promises to reduce environmental impacts, and meat looks set to be the latest thing to be given the Silicon Valley overhaul. Much like we expect from our phones, from our cars, that it will be better, cheaper, faster, safer, year by year. We should expect the same thing from our food. And, but once you start thinking about food, a, a cow as a, as a purely as a technology, and you apply those same technological insights we use elsewhere in our lives, you can start really thinking about what food should be, what food could be. That was cats. I think I'll stick to the salad the moment, which is lucky because I'm surrounded by the stuff. The thing that really hits you inside one of these containers is the smell. It's just lovely, all this concentrated fresh lettuce and you don't even get this, I don't think, in an open air field because it all blows away. But in here, wow, it's lovely. Everything looks lovely and fresh. Mm. I'm inside what is called a food computer where every aspect of the plant's growth cycle, the temperature, nutrient mix, humidity and light is monitored and controlled. This kind of computer-controlled hydroponics is allowing food scientists to not just replicate, but improve on Mother Nature's recipes. So every plant that we grow has a finely tuned growing algorithm to optimize its growth, its yield and its flavor profiles and nutrient characteristics. And that doesn't just mean more or bigger plants. It means that experts in artificial intelligence can tweak the plants in a way that nature can't. By doing so, we can actually 
um, improve on plants without messing with the DNA. So we're not actually changing the genetic makeup of the plant. This is like non-GMO GMO. And AI has a way to do that. Up in San Francisco, Babak Hodjat has been using AI to analyze data from MIT's food computers. And like local roots, he's found a new way of improving the herb basil. During a certain period of the growth of the basil, if we shone a certain spectrum of light 24-7, then the uh, volatiles for taste in the plant would uh, go up. Did, did a chef really come and say he wants his basil to be more peppery? <laughs> we actually brought in a couple chefs and had them sample basil that's going under various intensity of blue light, for example. And it actually increases the spiciness the more blue light you apply to basil. So you can suddenly say, what kind of basil would you like to buy and how spicy would you like it to be? And it's exciting the kind of conversation you get to have with your customers when you start asking them questions that even a 30-year veteran of the culinary industry has never been asked before. Not only does each variety get its own unique growing conditions, but artificial intelligence and computer vision are monitoring the plants, looking out for and treating any problems as soon as they're spotted. Local Roots hopes to place between 20 and 50 of its so-called terror farms right next to supermarkets' local distribution centres. It means the veg won't have to travel so far and it will be fresher when it hits the shelf. I've always needed a dressing on my salad because I thought it tasted quite bland without it. But this is really full of flavour because it is so fresh. I could even eat an entire bowl of this without any dressing. But some researchers don't like the idea of individual companies doing research by themselves. Putting life in a box is incredibly complex. It requires biology as much as chemistry, as much as plant physiology and, and biochemistry and data science and electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. It requires all disciplines. And so right now it's being tackled by a lot of startups and it's hard for those startups to have such a multidisciplinary approach. So this is why all of our work is open source, the hardware, the software, so that we can get more people thinking on the issue, so that we can ask the ex experts for advice. And we're not kind of stymied by intellectual property. At MIT's Media Lab, the Open Agricultural Initiative, or Open Ag, wants to create a worldwide collection of food hackers. One of the things that we've invented here we call the personal food computer. And it's like a hacker kit for uh, plants. And so what we've done is distributed all of the plans, all of the uh, materials, all of the tutorials open source, and it exploded. We now have a community of over 40 countries, over a thousand people. The great thing is, is their experiences are being recorded by sensors, because to use any of our advanced tools like machine learning or artificial intelligence, we need trillions of data points. Artificial intelligence can look for patterns among these data points, which are the results of thousands of experiments. And the more wide-ranging those experiments, the better. We might learn inside of a food computer what set of climate attributes cause the best expression of protein in a snow pea. Now, we might say, hey, where in the world are these collection of attributes naturally occurring? And then we should plant that genetics, those snow peas, in that place. So not only might food computers improve on nature, but they could also teach us more about how to get the best out of the earth that we have. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It's been a week where suspicions have been raised that a global cyber attack may have been caused by accountancy software. Security researchers suspect that a corrupted update to some Ukrainian accountancy software may have been the cause of the global infection, although the company behind the software denies these claims. Plus, a team at MIT has created drones that can drive and fly. Although these drones are diminutive, one day they could be the foundation for technology which facilitates flying cars. And it was the week that researchers at a university in Madrid revealed they'd been teaching a robot to iron clothes. The TIA robot's designers hope that eventually it'll be able to perform a whole host of different household chores. Hopefully a bit quicker than this, though. 
Famously, they say, dedication is what you need if you want to be a record breaker. It's also what you need if you want to recreate the teaser trailer for the next Star Wars film, The Last Jedi, on a 33-year-old Apple II computer. That's exactly what New York artist Wahayu Ikhwandadi has done, hand-drawing each frame with an old-school touch tablet, saving them all on 48 floppy disks, remember them, and then transferring them to a contemporary computer for final post-production. The force is strong with this guy. <laughs> Despite our quest for new ways of creating more food, we do actually have a huge issue with food waste. In the UK alone in 2015, consumers threw away £13 billion worth of food that could have been eaten. But we are getting more creative with ways to solve the problem. This community fridge in London's Brixton allows businesses, or indeed anyone, to drop off or help themselves to food that's fresh to eat. But big companies like Sainsbury's are taking on the challenge too. This week, various stores are trialling some new packaging for their ham. With 1.9 million slices thrown away each day, the supermarket want to find a way of being able to reassure customers once they're at home and they've opened the product. Because sometimes people throw it away not remembering when they opened it, so they don't know whether it's fresh or not. But the underneath of this piece of smart plastic is sensitive to air and temperature, so it'll start to react as soon as the package has been opened. It'll turn from yellow round to purple when it's telling you that the meat isn't good to eat anymore. Some other companies are focused on preserving food longer. Edipil is an invisible natural plant-based coating that aims to reduce oxidation and water loss. It's recently been trialled by some farmers in the US. There's also this It's Fresh filter paper, which aims to absorb ethylene, the gas that causes some fruit and veg to ripen. It's progressed from use in the supply chain to consumer packaging and now even being used in restaurants. Of course, for eateries, buying the exact amount of produce needed is nigh impossible. So whilst it won't help the financial loss, there are some apps to save the food being wasted. It's late afternoon in the office and I'm feeling a bit peckish, so I've sneaked out to get something to eat. But I'm not quite sure what I fancy. Too Good To Go will put restaurants' leftovers to good use, whilst also giving you a takeaway from as little as £2. What could I go for now, mid-afternoon? A juice. A juice looks good. The one issue here is that you can't actually be fussy about what you want to eat. You don't know what you're going to be getting. So going for a juice, well, in my view, it can't really go that wrong. OK, I get it may be hard to see the bargain factor with a juice, but some places do offer full meals. Hi there, I'm just here to collect my juice, please. Thanks, you too. But of course, it's not just restaurants who can end up with more than they need. If you've got food in your house that you want to avoid wasting, or you want to claim some from the neighbours, then I've found an app that could help. Olio searches your local area to find food being given away, and you can post whatever you have to offer. OK, I get that this isn't everyone's cup of tea, but this location-based app will show you everyone around you who's trying to donate unwanted food. So on my way home from work, there's some hummus, salad and milk available. That seems to be left over from a shop, actually. Somebody's offering a frozen banana, which does kind of seem like a joke. And of course, in true sharing economy fashion, you get a rating. The most important factor here is that we learn to change our habits. But of course, the easier that is made for us to do, the more likely we are to do so. Perfect. That was Lara. So throughout the program, we've been looking at technology that creates food. But how about food? that creates technology. Sounds crazy, I know, but Dan Simmons has been to Holland to cook up something very special. The 
this is a small twist on a classical Dutch dish called Hutzpot. And I've put a sausage on the side. This is Boerenkool. Mm. Yes, this year's Dutch Faster Chef winner has baked a car. It's a sports steering wheel. Firm suspension on the seats, is it? Is it right to say that nobody has driven this car before? Nobody outside the team, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll take good care Go of it. Go easy, all right. <laughs> I will take good care of it. All right, let's go this one. Okay. Most of Lena is organic, including these almost edible panels made from sugar beet, sandwiched between coatings of natural flax mixed with bioplastic. Yum. So we're just going to reverse this back down the, the yeah. track. Yeah. I've got my foot fully yeah. to the floor yeah, now. It's, lim it's, it's limited a lot. It's about four times more, uh, more uh, efficient with its energy than for instance, a Nissan Leaf or a BMW i3. I knew there was a reason to pick this car. <laughs> we picked up the flex ourselves in, uh, in the north of France. And uh, then we just started trying things. And we had to do a lot of tests. Um, uh, crash our material, break it, uh, uh, find the boundaries and the limits of the material. And eventually we came up with, well, our perfect biocomposite. And that is what we have used in Lina. It's 0 to 60 eventually. What do you mean? What, does it get to 60? Uh, no, it will be around 50, 55 miles. In fairness, it's a different kind of performance that Lina offers. The TU Ecomotive student team says cooking this car uses about 20% of the energy that aluminium or carbon fibre panels take to produce. And this week, Lina passed her road safety tests. She's expected out on public roads by the end of July. So I would not make the statement that, that currently the automotive industry is thinking about the portfolio of making biodegradable cars. But I'm sure they are thinking about circular economy. They are thinking about how can they take apart the current cars and the future cars and to reuse them to build new cars. So to really make a circular green economy. To make Lena a lean machine, the team have taken a sort of pared back approach. OK, we don't have the modern day luxuries of maybe a glove compartment or somewhere to place my coffee. But look, this is beautiful wood. I won't knock that too much. <laughs> so uh, I can't wind down the windows no. in this model. No. So we wait for the next model. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> We've got the uh, washer. There we go. And the key advantage of it is not just in driving it, but when you park it for the last time, a lot of this car will simply biodegrade. Now, the electric engine, batteries and suspension aren't organic, but the team hope Lena will inspire car makers to think beyond electric to make our cars even more eco-friendly. That was Dan in the Netherlands, and that's it from my little lettuce farm here in California. You can follow us on Twitter at BBC Click. We also live on Facebook, where you get loads of extra tech content every day through the week. Thanks for watching, and we will see you soon.